Hello, this is Dr. Subhangshu Das Gupta uh, from Department of Physics from IIT Ropar. Welcome to my class uh, on mechanics uh, and I will solve some problems in this particular class. So before I proceed, I will quickly uh, revise some basic ideas which you may feel something uh, very unique and something that will be useful in this particular class. Okay, so let me proceed. Um, so some important concepts I uh, wish that you will remember. Uh, one important concept is based on the third law of Newton. Uh, it says that uh, a force always acts in the opposite direction of an applied force. So we call such force thrust or tension. Just remember one important thing here. If this force is equal to the applied force, then definitely there is no effective force on the system. And the system will be not having any acceleration. Okay. But if there is an acceleration, this thrust or tension definitely will be different from the applied force. So this is an important concept, uh, sometimes confusing. I want you to remember during this particular class. There is another idea on friction. Uh, we know that friction prevents the motion. However, uh, what happens that um, to the energy conservation in the problem? Because if I apply a friction, it is a non-conservative process and the energy will not become conserved as far as mechanical component of the energy is concerned. Definitely, it will generate other kind of energy, for example, heat energy or so. And the third concept I want you to remember that uh, uh, any rotational motion is depending upon uh, the distance of the uh, particle from the so-called center of the force. Okay, so um, in the during the rotational motion, the particle force uh, uh, feels a force towards the center, and uh, uh, this particular kind of force is generally called centripetal uh, central force. And if it is a particular uh, like a force which is based on uh, one by r square, which is proportional to one by r square, in this particular case, such force has a special name which we call centripetal force. These three important concepts will be useful for uh, during the problem solving into the next part of this course. Okay, now let us start with our first problem. Okay, this question uh, considers a different scenario. Okay, so look at the figure first. You can easily see what is uh, says about so there is a m0 mass hanging over a pulley and uh, that it is connected with by threads with two other masses m1 and m2 so point is that uh, we want to know what is the acceleration with which the mass m0 comes down uh, there would be an acceleration only because uh, the um, uh, mass is feeling a force downward due to gravity. However, the mass m1 and m2 are pulling it back upward. Okay, so definitely there must uh, require a force balance to maintain some kind of uh, steady state situation. So we also want to calculate the tension of the thread binding together the masses m1 and m2. That means the tension right here on this thread between m1 and m2. Now let us consider the force equations for three different masses. First consider the mass m0. The mass m0 you can see the right side red diagram. It is filling a force m0g and definitely because it is connected by a thread and it is trying to pull upward, it has a tension. We call it now tension which is T1. 
so now we know that the m0 mass is moving with an acceleration as of now let us not comment too much the acceleration can be upward or downward we assume let us let it be up or downward if it is negative then our if we find it negative then we can say that the uh, mass is going upward with an acceleration so for the sake of argument we call this a the effective acceleration of the mass m0 which is downward so now you can easily check the force balance m0 g has to be larger such that it moves downward so our force equation is m0g minus t1 t1 is like preventing motion downward so m0g minus t1 is equal to m0a it is the right side on the right hand side i have written the effective force on the uh, mass now let us go to the second um, mass m1 for m1 what is happening it is on a horizontal surface you can easily see and then you can see that it is feeling a force which is t1 the same tension that m0 mass is feeling also it is feeling a force rightward to the mass m2 because uh, t2 mass is uh, the tension of the other thread connecting the m2 now because m0 is down uh, moving downward so definitely the effective acceleration of the m1 mass will also be on the left side such that it is trying to go down with m0 in this particular situation you can easily say that definitely t1 this tension is larger than t2 there is also another force working backward on the right hand side towards right which is k into m1g this k is the frictional coefficient and m1g is the, the gravitational force it feels we know that this is the force due to friction and this t2 and this k m1g are trying to oppose the motion of the mass m1 in any case t1 has to be larger such that it actually makes a motion with an acceleration a and that is why we can say that t1 minus t2 minus k m1g is equal to m1a now do it for uh, mass m2 it is much simpler than the case of m1 in this case the mass m2 is moving to the left and it is feeling the same force t2 and this t2 minus k m2g which is nothing but the frictional force of the mass m2 working uh, i mean on towards right it giving rise to the effective force that the mass m2 is feeling which is m2 into a now our job will be to find a and the t2 okay t2 is the tension between the masses m1 and m2 so it is straight forward problem first what you can do you try to calculate um, i mean try to eliminate t1 from our problem so to do that you first add these two equations on the screen and you can simply see that it is nothing but t1 minus kg m1 plus m2 is equal to m1 plus m2 into a this is one of the equations now go to the first equation and then add the last equation together what was the first equation just to remind you this was the first equation i had m0g minus t1 is equal to m0a on the right hand on the other equation you have t1 minus kg into m1 plus m2 is m1 plus m2 into a so in these two equations you have t1 uh, with a negative sign and a positive sign so if i add these two equations you will eliminate t1 and you will have the term like m0g minus kg into m1 plus m2 is equal to m0 plus m1 plus m2 into a so you can easily calculate a in terms of the known 
um, given uh, elements m0, m1, m2, k and the gravitational acceleration g. So finally, you because you know A, so you can go back to the equation for T2, T2 minus k m to g is equal to m to a, put the a that you just got and you will get some expression of T2. That is what is done. So T2 is nothing but m to a plus k m to g and this putting a here, you will get this particular expression. It is straightforward. And you can easily see that the expression depends upon all the given coefficients m0, m1, m2 and k. Okay, so we got the answers of both the questions. The acceleration a that the mass m0 is going down with and the t2, the tension between the two masses m1 and m2. Okay, now let us start with our Second problem. Before proceeding, let us read the question. A plank of mass m1 with a bar of mass m2. That means the drawing that I have, the lower part is called a plank and the upper part is called a bar. So this bar placed on it, this lies on the smooth horizontal plane. That means there is no friction at all. Can we consider that actually? So think it in this way, that M1 is not feeling any frictional force, but I never said anything about the surface of M1 on which M2 is placed. Now, a horizontal force growing with time T, so uh, F is equal to alpha T is applied to the bar. So, the force is applied to the bar, however, force is not a constant, it is a function of time. Now, if the coefficient of friction between the plank and the bar is equal to k, that means uh, on the surface, interface between m2 and m1, there is a frictional coefficient non which is non-zero and equal to k. So, if this is so, we need to calculate, find the time capital T when the plank and the bar will start moving at different acceleration. So, what does that mean? So, suppose you have a force, if you apply it to M2, then it will keep on moving together because M1 and M2 will start moving together. When M2 and M1 will not move together, of course, when you have an additional force M2, which overcomes the frictional force on M1. So, how the force becomes larger on M2? Because the force is increasing with time, and there would be some particular time, call it capital T, after which the force on the M2 will be larger than the frictional force on the uh, when it is on the m1 mass so this is the point we i wanted to tell you that for the mass m2 the effective situation is this f is the force minus k m2 g is the frictional force uh, i mean um, acting backward and that gives rise to an acceleration which is m2 into a and if I know that at this particular situation, your force is equal to alpha t, then capital T, then alpha t minus k, k m to j is equal to m2 into alpha t by m1 plus m2. What is written within the bracket? This is nothing but the acceleration at that particular time, capital T, and that acceleration is the acceleration of both the masses together, okay? Because uh, the tie, the up to T is equal to capital T, both the masses are moving together. But once the force on the M2 becomes larger, then M2 um, adds some additional motion in addition to what M1, uh, addition, in addition to the motion of M1. Our job is to simply solve this problem in terms of capital T. 
so the rest is simple you put the capital t terms on the left and then you can easily solve capital t is equal to k m2 g m1 plus m2 by m1 alpha so the block will move with the same acceleration till t is equal to capital t okay now let us start with our third problem let us read the question first a pulley fixed to the ceiling of an elevator okay so this circle is a pulley and it is fixed to the ceiling of the elevator this entire rectangular box is my elevator and this uh, pulley carries a thread the thread and whose ends are attached to the loads of mass m1 and m2 now the entire box is moving upward with an acceleration omega w now our job is to find the acceleration of the load m1 relative to the elevator this is very interesting so we can consider uh, different situations one situation is this that let us choose m1 going downward and m2 going up and because they are connected by a thread their acceleration actual acceleration is a okay the effective acceleration i mean when i see it from the outside i mean from an inertial frame now what is happening so for the mass m1 what will be the uh, total force that it is feeling downward just check it out m1 g is the force it is feeling downward and m1 the omega uh, w will be the force which is also feel it it is feeling downward okay because the two motions that is motion of the mass m1 and the motion of the uh, mass um, motion of the elevator are in the opposite directions so this is very interesting that they are feeling such um, such uh, i mean um, uh, such forces downward okay so now point is that uh, so this is uh, remember that g and omega are actually uh, play, playing uh, i mean um, acting on the opposite directions and that is why the effective acceleration is nothing but g minus minus omega and that is nothing but g plus omega and this is true for the mass m2 also the only difference of the masses m1 and m2 are that they one of them the mass m1 has an acceleration downward and the mass m2 has an acceleration upward and the tension capital t on the thread in for both the cases are acting upward okay so this is the total situation of the forces okay now let us go to the uh, force equations of course for the mass m1 because the um, mass m1 is moving downward its uh, effective force to the uh, downward will be m1g plus m1 omega minus capital t and that will be nothing but m1a and for the mass m2 because it is moving upward the force upward is larger the tension capital t is larger than the force downward and that gives rise to the effective acceleration of the mass m2 so our job is to find a first a is what a is the acceleration of the masses m1 and m2 and that is nothing but if, if you can add these two expressions you can easily calculate it to be m1 minus m2 m1 uh, into omega plus g divided by m1 plus m2 now this is the absolute acceleration of the mass m1 downward now remember that the mass m1 if i see it from the inertial frame it is uh, moving downward with an acceleration a now if i am within the um, uh, if i am within the accelerator what will be the feeling that um, acceleration with respect to the elevator 
that means if i am also moving with the elevator on top of that the mass m1 is moving downward then definitely the acceleration will be added up because the two accelerations are in the opposite directions and when they are in opposite direction the value of one acceleration with respect to the other can be calculated by just adding up okay and uh, in this way a plus omega will be the acceleration with respect to the elevator okay and that is nothing but uh, putting a here the expression that we got plus omega will give you an expression like m1 minus m2 into g plus 2 m1 omega by m1 plus m2 check one important thing suppose omega is zero there is no acceleration then definitely the acceleration with respect to the elevator is the same as the actual acceleration of the mass m1 so this is very important um, uh, limiting case of the situation where i can tell you that um, 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 i mean whenever you do a problem you must check the limiting cases so that you will can uh, understand if there is any mistake or not okay now let us start with our fourth problem uh, in this problem uh, we again uh, let us read the problem first at the moment t is equal to 0 the force f is equal to alpha t is applied to a small body of mass m okay so here is my mass m and it is uh, smooth uh, rest it is put on a uh, smooth horizontal plane and i have applied a force f and f is time dependent is a similar problem that we have done however the force is no longer parallel to the ground in this case it is making an angle theta find the velocity of the body at the moment of its breaking of the plane what does it mean by breaking of the plane it is nothing that the mass m will uh, leave the ground this is the point uh, at we we need to know the velocity okay why do we expect the mass m will leave the ground only because as time proceeds the force f increases f is equal to alpha t increases and when the force is large enough then the mass m will go up our job is to calculate the velocity of the body when the mass exactly leaves the ground we call it breaking of the plane now what is the force equation the force equation is very simple first check the force upward is nothing but the thrust of the ground capital r and f sin theta is the force component of the applied force f and this component is towards the vertical towards the normal to the ground and this has to be equal to mg mg is the force downward so r plus f sin theta is equal to mg now whenever the mass m breaks off what will happen it will uh, it will not have any thrust because thrust was coming from the ground and if it does not touch the ground any more then definitely capital r has to be zero so at break up point you have a situation which is f sin theta is equal to mg now what is f f is a into capital t capital t is the moment at which it breaks off the ground and so a t sin theta becomes mg and we can calculate the capital t right here in this way mg by a sin theta now we can also find out the velocity at the time capital t okay so this is not very complicated you must consider the other force equation what was the other force equation the f cos theta is the force parallel to the ground okay and then m is the mass having a, an acceleration a 
a is the acceleration so this f cos theta will become m a because because of m cos theta the mass is moving to the right <coughs> so uh, if i put this equation uh, and then write down instead of f sorry, f is equal to alpha t and cos theta and this becomes m dv dt a is nothing but the rate of change of the speed dv dt so our job is to calculate the uh, change in v so you put this differential dt to the left and write down the two parts of the equations in this way m integrating from 0 to v dv is equal to uh, alpha t cos theta dt 0 to capital t we are assuming that the initial speed of the bar mass is zero and we are trying to, we are trying to calculate small v which is the velocity uh, speed of the uh, mass at time capital t however because force is not a constant we have to do this kind of integration so the left side integration is very simple it will give you m into v and the right side integration will give rise to a capital t square by 2 so you can easily calculate v from here so v is equal to alpha cos theta by 2m is into capital t is replaced by mg by alpha sin theta check it out capital t was mg by a sin theta and uh, so in this case i have written this expression uh, square and then it gives rise to mg square by alpha cos theta by sin square theta okay so just checking check one important thing that if theta is equal to pi by 2 then v will become uh, cos uh, will be become, become proportional to cos pi by 2 and v is equal to 0 So if the force is applied at theta is equal to pi by 2 angle uh, the system the uh, mass will not move at all it will not have in the final velocity which is non zero v will become zero so if i apply a force right at that time uh, it increases it will simply leave the ground with the same velocity uh, speed, uh, speed v and if theta is equal to zero then we cannot say anything about v because v becomes infinity that basically means that the uh, at, at the time uh, at which the um, mass will leave the ground will become too large and the velocity by that time is too large v tends to infinity please remember this is little awkward because the velocity of a mass cannot be larger in any case than the speed of light because we are doing the problem in a non relativistic domain we are having v tends to infinity limit which is otherwise unphysical but the problem gives similar result uh, in this case okay now let us start with our fifth problem in this problem we now talking we are now talking about a rotational motion in this rotational motion problem what we do a particle of mass m uh, moves uh, along a circle of radius capital r okay uh, with a constant speed v so when i say the speed is v velocity however is not the same at each different point okay we are now asked to calculate the magnitude of the force acting on the particle over the distance equal to a quarter of a circle first of all let us try to understand what does that mean by quarter of a circle a circle is like coming starting from cap point a and then back to point a quarter means one fourth of the entire path so that means it is nothing but going from a to b only that is it is making a 90 degree angle at the center three fourth part is still pending we are not asking to cover uh, the rest of the part we are only asking 
the magnitude of the force during the motion of the dis uh, distance a to b so how do we calculate the force before anything force is nothing but the rate of change in linear momentum so initial linear momentum is mv j hat because the force is always as uh, so velocity is always uh, tangent to the instantaneous point of the path then vi is the v i for initial v initial is nothing but a force acting to the j direction positive y direction and at the point v uh, b the particle is having a velocity which is pointing to the negative x direction however speed remains the same so the magnitude of the linear momentum is mv minus here takes care of the direction and i is the unit vector for that direction so this is the final momentum it is minus mv into i so what will be the momentum change it is nothing but delta p which is nothing but the final momentum minus initial momentum i have written it like minus mv i minus mv j now we are asked to know the magnitude of the force so let us go ahead now point is that when i say that the, there is a change in momentum we need to know during how long time this momentum change has happened so what is the period period means what period means the time taken for the particle for going from point a and back to point b via the circle for one time rotation okay so a period will be nothing but the entire path traveled which is 2 pi i into capital r divided by small v because 2 pi r is the path traveled and v is the v and then we can easily calculate it as um, the total period however to traverse a quarter of cycle circle that means one fourth of the path the time taken will also be one fourth because the speed remains the same and that is how it becomes delta t is equal to 1/4 of the period 2 pi r by v and that is pi r by 2 v so the force becomes change of momentum divided by change of the time interval i mean there is a total time interval so it becomes minus mvi minus mvj the thing that we have written before divided by delta t pi r by 2 v and it becomes minus 2 mv square by pi r i plus j this is the force vector remember if we are want to calculate the force magnitude the you can easily see the magnitude means the length of the vector within the bracket and this is nothing but root of her 2 and magnitude does not have any sign i have taken the absolute value of the entire force term and it becomes 2 mv square by pi r into square root of 2 so this is the force magnitude just check it out one important thing you probably would tend to give the answer in simple way like because it is rotating within a circle the force would be the simple centripetal force which is given by mv square by r but it is not exactly mv square by r it is mv square by r into 2 root 2 by pi so please check it yourself that how the force magnitude becomes in this square by r now let us start with our problem number 6 here the problem is rather different i have mixed the two problems that i have uh, discussed before uh, here those two problems are like um, there is a circular motion um, and also at some point the mass is leaving the surface it is like uh, go, going off the surface so let us try to understand the problem here the small body capital a starts sliding off the top 
of a smooth sphere of radius capital R. So the circle that I have drawn, it is nothing but a sphere. And it is starting uh, going down, sliding down the surface of the uh, sphere. We need to calculate the at what angle theta the body breaks off the sphere. So we have already have some experience with considering such problem before when the body breaks off the surface of the motion, what happens? The surface thrust becomes zero. That is the point you please remember. Now we will use this particular issue very soon. Okay. Before anything, we first try to understand what does that mean by the problem. We know that the particle is moving downward due to gravity and at some point the speed becomes so large that it actually goes away from the surface. It simply falls down away from the surface of the sphere. It happens at a particular angle theta and interestingly this theta is not for, uh, 90 degree. Theta is something different. We need to calculate at which theta this exactly happens. So we, let us try to consider the energy conservation first. So in energy conservation problem, we can say that for at this particular angle theta, suppose the, uh, surface, the mass M has a kinetic energy and also a potential energy. The potential energy is how much? It is mg into uh, it is uh, enter length is r, okay, the radius is r, this is also r and r cos theta means this point somewhere here, probably you can see on the mouse and then r minus r cos theta is nothing but the horizontal, dis, uh, I mean uh, the vertical uh, motion, vertical displacement of the mass from the initial position on the top and that is the total change in the potential which is mg r minus r cos theta and that uh, reduction of the potential gives rise to the kinetic energy. Okay, so definitely, the, uh, I mean, it is nothing but uh, the potential energy change um, is tra getting transferred into the kinetic energy. So from this uh, expression, you can easily calculate your V square. So V square is nothing but 2 GR into 1 minus cos theta and then V square by GR becomes 2 into 1 minus cos theta. Let us leave the problem at this point. Now, uh, go to the next stage of the problem. <clears throat> Let us consider the force part. What will be the force? I will use the fact that the force here, which is uh, mg cosine theta, which is uh, uh, maybe we can carefully check in which direction this mg cosine theta is uh, uh, acting on the mass. So mg is the force downward due to gravity and this angle is theta and uh, then mg cosine theta is a force which is acting towards the center. Okay, And capital N is the thrust of the surface on the mass M. And definitely it is acting on the, in the direction perpendicular to the surface all the time. So mg minus cosine theta has to be larger than capital N. Otherwise the particle will not feel a force towards the center of the motion. In this case, this mg is creating the effective mv square by r, the centripetal force that the particle is feeling towards the center. So the centripetal force is coming out of the um, force component due to gravity towards the center and the uh, normal uh, thrust on the sur of the surface to the mass. So mg cosine theta minus n is mv square by r. And as you know, at an angle theta, 
your capital N becomes 0. So, we are simply putting N is equal to 0 and out of this force equation, we are simply writing mv square by r is equal to mg cosine theta. So, here also you can have v square by gr is equal to cosine theta. Now, go back to the previous slide. You have v square by gr is 2 into 1 minus cosine theta. So, this 2 into 1 minus cosine theta is cosine theta should be equal to cosine theta as we just got. So, you can easily solve for cosine theta right here. It comes like 3 cosine theta is 2 and cosine theta is 2 by 3. So, theta can be calculated as 48 degree. So, it is exactly not 90 degree, it is not even 60 degree, not even 45 degree. It becomes 48 degree and this particular angle does not depend upon the mass, radius or anything or even the gravitational acceleration g. Okay, this is very interesting to note. Now, we are going to talk about our problem number 7. In this problem, what will you do? We will have a small body. It is also coming down from the top and then what happens? It reaches a point O and then makes a circle. Okay. But at, uh, while moving this, there is a point B where the particle leaves the circle surface. We want to know at where it will happen. So, a small body starts sliding from a height capital H down an inclined groove as it is shown passing into a half circle of radius capital H by 2. Now, find the velocity of the body at the highest point of the trajectory. Remember, the highest point of the trajectory need not be here. Rather, it can be somewhere before the topmost point of this circle and the point becomes capital B. That, what does it mean by highest point of the trajectory? At the point when it breaks off the groove. So, our job is to first calculate what is the velocity at capital A point. It is nothing but 2g capital H because the particle must have started from rest and have come has come down by a height capital H. So, at point B, the speed we consider to be small vb. Now, consider the energy conservation. Energy conservation says that it is half mvb square uh, which is the kinetic energy and also the potential energy is mg h by 2 into 1 plus cosine theta. Let us check it out whether it is really true. The height of the point B is h by 2 like up to this point. Uh, I mean this is the radius part and this, this particular uh, radius is also h by 2. So, h by 2 cosine theta means basically this height from the center to the point B. So, that is why total height is h by 2 plus h by 2 cosine theta. This is the total potential energy and this has to be equal to half mva square which is the kinetic energy of the particle at point A. It did not have any potential energy at point A. We assume the potential energy at point A is 0. So, we need to simply um, uh, consider this equation and consider the force equation also. The force equation is important because ultimately we need to use this capital N, the thrust and at the point of breaking off, we will put this capital N to be 0. So, what is the force equation? Just check it out. Mg cosine theta is the force which is particularly acting on the surface, uh, I mean it is acting on the, uh, on the system, uh, on the particle B which is downward and then uh, capital N is the thrust and then this uh, right hand side is again becoming the um, centripetal force of the particle. So, the effective force is on the right 
which is nothing but mv square by r where r is the radius which is h by 2. Now at the point of breaking off your capital N has to be 0. Okay. So uh, we, are assume, we are considering that fact and then we are writing from the second equation here vv square is equal to the expression gh by 2 cosine theta. So our job is to put this vv square term on the equation 1. So if I put that in the equation 1, it becomes gh, gh comes from the right hand side where we have put vs square which is 2gh. So if I put 2gh, it becomes gh, m cancels on the both sides and the right hand side becomes uh, a big expression like that. So, you can easily see that cos theta can be calculated out of here. So, it is 3 by 4 cosine theta is half or cosine theta is 2 by 3. So, we, need, we do not need to know at which angle uh, the particle uh, breaks off the surface. Rather, we need to know what is the velocity or speed of the particle at that point. So, that is nothing but vv square. Just put cosine theta in this expression which is 2 by 3 and that gives rise to vb is equal to root over gh by 3. Okay. So, this is the, the problem looks little longer but please remember the basic ideas. Either you need to choose energy conservation or force equation or both and at the point of breaking up you simply put your thrust or tension to be 0. Now we will discuss the next problem, the problem number 8. Uh, here you have two bars of masses M1 and M2 connected by a spring whose uh, stiffness is K and length is L0 in the non-deformed state. Okay, That means its actual length is L0. It rests on a uh, smooth horizontal plane. Now you apply a force on the mass M2. You need to calculate the maximum and minimum distance between the bars during the subsequent motion of the system. So calculate the force equation before anything. So force equations are F minus Kx is equal to M2 into A for the mass M2. What is X? X is the increase in the length of the uh, spring from L1. So, x is just the increase, uh, increased, uh, uh, increase, I mean, the increment of the length. So, that gives rise to the additional force by Hooke's law and that is always preventing the motion. We have put a minus kx sign and that gives rise to the effective force of the mass m2. And for the mass m1, there is no direct force being applied. So, Kx is the only force that is pulling the mass m1 with the uh, such that Kx becomes m1a. Now, if I add these two expressions, it becomes m m1 plus m2 into a. So, a becomes f by m1 plus m2. Now, what is x by the way? So, to calculate x, you can put a in either of these two equations and uh, we can easily calculate that. Okay. So, we can easily say that x can be simply written by, by considering the energy stored in the string which is half kx square and that is nothing but uh, equal to the force applied on the mass m into the uh, in, uh, displacement of the uh, particle and that will give rise to uh, m1 putting the value of a into x. So, out of here x becomes 2f m1 by k m1 plus m2. So, this is the same expression that you would get right from here. That is not a problem. You will get the similar expression. Now, then what is the minimum distance? That is L0 in any case, minimum distance between the two masses and maximum distance will become L0 plus x, which is L0 plus this new expression. 
Okay, now we will discuss the next problem, the problem number 9. This problem can be little tricky and uh, we can simply say that um, a steel ball of mass 50 grams fall from a height of 1 meter on the horizontal surface of a massive slab. Okay. Find the total momentum that the ball imparts to the slab after many bounces. If every impact decreases the velocity of the ball 0.8 times. So, we need to find out that um, at what will be the momentum trans trans uh, transfer during each of the bounce. So, start from uh, start, uh, consider the particle is uh, falling from a top with uh, starting from a zero speed, it when it touches the ground, its speed becomes just before it touches root over 2gh. Now, after the first bounce, the speed becomes upward which is v2 and which is e into v1. So, this e is nothing but 0 0.8. Now, momentum imparted is nothing but the initial momentum and final momentum and difference between them. So, it is nothing but mv1 minus minus mv2 minus additional minus sign comes because the direction of the motion changes and it becomes m v1 plus v2 and then it by putting v2 is equal to e v1 it becomes m v1 into 1 plus e. Now, do the same problem for the second bounce. For the second bounce, it becomes mv2 minus minus mv3 because mv2 is the, uh, because v2 is the speed when it comes back again to the ground. And in the same way, you have the m uh, v2 plus v3 and it becomes, by putting v3 is equal to e v2, m v2 1 plus e. And putting V2 now as EV1, it becomes MV1, 1 plus E. This is almost the similar expression that we got before, except an additional E factor. So, I have put that E factor in an arrow. So, in the third bounds, the momentum imparted will be uh, MV1, 1 plus E multiplied by E square. So, the multiplicating factor is increasing like 1 e e square e cube e to the power 4 and so on. So, the total bounce after many bounces, the total momentum imparted will become mv1 1 plus c and additional terms will be added and we know this bracketed part is 1 by 1 minus c and uh, that is it. We can now put the values of E, M, V1 and uh, everything else. You will get the value of capital P. So, M is 50 gram. We put it in SI unit 0 0.05 kg. H is equal to 1 meter and E is equal to 0 0.8. And G is used to be 9.8 meter per second square. Putting all those values, you, we have these expressions which is 2 kilogram meter per second. Okay, now next we will talk about the problem number 10. Okay, in this last problem, we will discuss about a problem of projectile motion, where there is some mix of kinematics of a particle and also the gravitational force. So, the, let us first read the problem. There is a small disk that is sliding down from the top of a hill. It is a smooth hill, there is no friction. So, it is coming down through this black line to the point capital A. The hill has a height capital H. However, capital A is at little, um, uh, up, 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 I mean, uh, it is at a height, small h from the ground. Okay. Now, this hill has a horizontal portion at the end. So, my hill starts from the top and ends at the capital A and the last part before the point A is horizontal. 
our question will be how high the capital A should be that means what is the value of small h from the ground uh, the height of the point A from the ground um, uh, such that it covers the maximum distance capital S before it touches the ground. We know after it touches the ground, uh, it will roll down and due to the friction maybe it may stop. But we are not caring about that portion. We want to know at which, how far from the edge of this ridge uh, it will touch the ground. And that uh, distance has to be maximum. So that means we are given capital H. We want to know the value of small h such that capital S is maximum. First of all, we need to calculate the velocity at that point A. Because the point A part is kind of horizontal part, so that means the velocity component of the disk at the point A has to be um, horizontal component. Okay, There will be no vertical component. So, we understand the velocity component will be root over 2g capital H minus small h. The initial velocity of the disk is 0 and that is the, uh, this is why the expression of small v becomes this. Remember, capital H minus small h is the distance that the disks travel from the top point to the capital A. Distance along the vertical direction due to the gravity. Now, how far, how long the disk will take to fall down from the edge of the ridge to the ground? Definitely the disk will not suddenly fall down. There will be a projectile motion. It will fly in air some distance and then it will touch the ground. Okay, this time can be uh, understood as root over 2h by small g. These are coming from the standard kinematic equation. So now we have the time to fall by the height h. That means time to it takes to uh, touch the ground. Basically, this is the same time. And we know the horizontal component of the uh, velocity of the disk. <coughs> So, uh, so uh, let, let us try to figure out the horizontal distance capital S uh, for this particular uh, problem. Capital S will be the V into T. The V expression is this and expression of T is given by this. Simplifying the expression, it becomes this. This is a function of H. Now, we want to maximize capital S which simply means that we have to take the derivative of S with respect to H and then uh, it has to be made 0. By taking the derivative of capital S, we get this big expression and to make it 0, our, its numerator has to be 0. So the numerator is capital H minus 2H has to be 0. That gives rise to the height small h of the ridge to be capital H by 2. This is exactly half of the height of the hill. Okay, so that's it for this particular class. My best wishes for your future endeavor. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.